Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. blessed because we have so many people, so many pastors that, um, true pastors that have so many giftings and callings, and I'm personally really glad that you're um, being called into evangelism because it sounds like a very dangerous business, and so um, I'll just stay here, and then you go out and take care of that, okay? I appreciate that. Now, if you don't have a handout, please raise your hand, and we will get you a handout, and if you have a Bible, we're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 to 14, and Church, I just, you know, it's really important, even the children's ministry, that we can take things away and learn things. And I don't know if you picked up on what Josh said today, but it definitely spoke to me. Because I'm a person that doesn't carry around a lot of cash. And if he's telling me I have to have 10 bucks to get into heaven, I'm praying that the man at the pearly gates accepts credit cards. So um, I'm going to have to keep at least 10 bucks in my uh, pocket. Although I think mine's going to be more than 10 bucks for that. But if you have... Your Bible is chapter 23. If you don't have a Bible with you, please raise your hand and we will get you a Bible. And if you don't own a Bible, please accept it as a gift from us to you. And I've been trying to, you know, I'm trying to like delay because, can I just speak about Apple for a minute? We talked about I everything. If you have an Apple iPhone, iPad or anything, do not get the latest update because it has killed my phone and it is now killing my iPad to the point where it takes me 20 minutes to open stuff up. And so there it is. Okay, now I have my sermon. So... Apple's bad. Apple's just bad. I've decided, okay, so don't, don't do that. I know people are going to be upset with me, but I got a bone to pick with what's his name with that. But um, as you know, as we've been going through this series on the festival, there's really been, regardless of the festival, there's been two themes throughout of it. Number one, remembrance, and number two, honor. We're learning that the Jewish people were taught and they practiced remembering God, and then in all things they were to honor God. And I have to tell you, in many ways in our society now, those two things are significantly lacking when it comes to God. Now, I don't know if you heard this, but I read this article, and it was in a lot of different um, publications. I got this out of foxnews.com. It says, there's a new version of the Holy Bible that replaces every mention of God with Kanye West. It is called the Book of Jesus, Y-E-E-Z-U-S, a nod to one of West's albums, was created by fans and it claims to be a Bible for the modern day. The creators explain what if the Bible, the most singularly significant publication in the ancient canon of Western tradition, were updated to reflect our modern society. What would it look like? What we came up with was an interventionist art, coffee table novelty, that it will appeal to both Kanye fans everywhere and those made curious by this enormous cultural phenomenon. Now, I hope you're offended, because I am. But then I started thinking about something else, and Janine and I were talking about it this weekend. Why would they do that to the Bible and not do it to the Quran? Yeah, I raised up, they're like, I know, I know, I know. Because they know the Muslims would be upset, they would riot, they'd get angry. They know the Christians, for the most part, are like, oh, that's too bad, so, so bad. Right? But people every day are taking shots at our religion, taking shots at our beliefs, taking shots at our God. And we as a society allow that to happen. We have ISIS who has now made it their personal agenda to wipe out Christians everywhere. And even, I don't know if you heard this, they just attacked somewhere in, I think, Afghanistan or Iraq or somewhere. 
Even now, um, the Taliban are saying, we condone what they're doing. You see, throughout the world, Christians are becoming the target for everybody. And it's people like this, and I don't know Kanye West, I don't know if he had anything to do with it, but I am significantly offended that somebody would replace all references to God in my Bible with someone else's name. But it indicates what we're doing as a society. As a society, we are becoming more self-sufficient, self-serving, self-gratifying than ever before. And as we learn about the Jewish people in the Old Testament who are about self-sacrificing for the most part, I know they had to do a lot of push-ups, Josh, because they got into the sin issue as well. But, but we continue to move away from God. We continue to make ourselves God, and we continue to make those around us God. And I hope it infuriates you as much as it infuriates me. And as we've learned throughout these traditions and these festivals, we have seen that every aspect of the Jewish life, back then and even today, every aspect of the Jewish life was supposed to be filled with honor and remembrance for Yahweh, for God. Honoring and remembering what he had given, what was given by God, Honoring and remembering what had been done by God. Honoring and remembering that we should give thanks to God. And as we look at Leviticus chapter 23, and we look at the, the festivals in there, this is one chapter, if, if you were a good Jew, and if you only knew one chapter in the Bible, this was the one chapter that you were expected to know. Because this was the seven festivals that God had told the Jewish people they were to follow. How to follow them, when to follow them, why to follow them, and in some cases, even where to follow them. So if you were Jewish back in the Old Testament, and probably still today, if you were Jewish and you didn't know anything about these festivals, you would honestly be banished by your Jewish relatives and people around you. You know, we had um, this last Sunday night, for those of you that came to the Seder dinner, thank you, that was just amazing. We had someone from Jews for Jesus here. Now, in general, Jewish people are not liked in this world, right? There are a lot of people that want to see Israel just completely wiped off the face of the map. Now, consider being a Jew for Jesus. Okay, so not only are you not liked because you're Jewish, but then you have the people inside your own religion, inside your own families that don't like it because you believe in Jesus Christ. And the person we had here from Jews for Jesus, Amy, a great, great girl, had said that some of her fellow followers of Jews for Jesus, when they accepted Jesus into their lives, and when they told their families they accepted Jesus into their lives, their families actually had funerals for them to send a message to them that they were dead to them because they're a choice to follow Jesus Christ. But yet they still continue to do it. And throughout all of these festivals, it's interesting to see how the Jews for Jesus link all of these festivals back to Jesus. Because we'll see in the first four, or excuse me, the first three festivals that we talk about have already been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And the remaining four festivals that we're going to learn about this year will be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And as we look at Leviticus chapter 23, it tells the Jewish people, and quite honestly, it's interesting for us to read to see how it relates to Jesus, it tells them how and what to follow. The first three feasts that we, we talk about in Leviticus chapter 3, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits are all closely related. They're all celebrated in the first month of Nisan of the Jewish calendar. They're all considered pilgrim festivals because it's not something that you can do at your house, but you're actually expected to go somewhere to a place of worship or something in order to celebrate this festival. These, these festivals were representing special joy and celebration, and they were all linked to agricultural events. The fourth festival, the Feast of Pentecost, is, um, comes next, and then the last three festivals, the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, were also all very closely related, and they were all celebrated in the last month of the Jewish calendar. And so a good Jew would religiously, pardon the pun, religiously follow Leviticus chapter 23 because they wanted to make sure they were not only in good standing with God, but they wanted to be in good standing with their temple, they wanted to be in good standing with their fellow Jews and their family. 
So if you ask any Jewish people about Leviticus chapter 23, I'm sure that they will say what it's about. They will be able to tell you all that it's about. But today we're going to look at the Feast of the First Fruits. And as the name implies, it has to do with first. We are going to be reminded about what the concept of the first really means in the Bible and what it really means to us as well. So if you please join me, we're go ahead and stand. We're going to read Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 14. And beginning in verse 9 it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheep for the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheep a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. His grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of him. You shall eat neither bread nor parched green, green nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You can uh, go ahead and have a seat. Now, I want to put, there's a lot in these small little verses that, that I want to kind of put into context so you will understand them. Now, first off, in Israel, the grains were planted in the fall. The first grain that would be germinated, according to Exodus chapter 9, verses 31 to 32, was, was grain, was barley, excuse me, and then it was flax, and then the third would be wheat. So this first festival, what they're celebrating here is barley. The fact that actually barley, uh, the barley crops grew. Now, you have to understand back then, you know, if you drive anywhere now in Central California, really, if you drive by any farms, they all have those huge, big watering wheels, and, you know, they can water as much as they have. And I don't know if you noticed, part of the, the, the debate that's going on in California right now with our water shortage is that the farmers are taking the water. And they're saying, well, we have, and I don't understand all, but they, they're saying we have rights to the water, so we're taking what we have rights to. And the government, the state is saying, well, hold on a sec, you don't have those rights anymore because your rights are draining the deltas dry. So there's some battle going on right now. But, but back in Israel, they didn't have all of that stuff. So they would, they would faithfully plant those seeds, and they would rely solely on God to water those seeds. So if God, you know, if, if we were Israel here in California, we wouldn't have a lot of crops to be celebrating right now, amen, because of all the drought. So they completely relied on God and His covering and blessing in order for those crops to grow. And unlike us, where we can go to Steer Brothers or Ralph's or Bonds or Albertson, if those crops didn't come in, they couldn't run to a store to get them. So they were completely reliant and dependent upon God providing the rain that they needed for these crops to grow. So that's why this festival was so important to them, because they were actually celebrating the fact that the barley had grown in. Now, another interesting thing is they would always plant the seed exactly 70 days before the Passover, so that they could celebrate that time. Isn't that faith, church? Like, you would get it down to the day that you know that God would provide exactly 70 days later than that. But this day, because of all that, this day is called the Feast of the First Fruits because this is the first crop that would come in for the Israelites of the year. Now, not everybody would celebrate this feast because if you didn't, if you didn't plant a crop, there's really no need for you to celebrate this because there's no crops to celebrate. Or let's say you had a bad year and for some unknown reason... The, the rain didn't come and you didn't have a crop. There was nothing to celebrate. So the only people, the only Jewish people that celebrated this were the people, the farmers, that grew the barley and the barley uh, grew into them. And the Israelites who had the harvest, what it says is a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So they would bring a sheep of their harvest to the priest. Now, if you don't know what a sheep is, it would be kind of like a branch of the grain, kind of one of the long grains that they would have. And it's not just 
anything. How many of us, like, if we're going to a, uh, we forgot that we were invited to a birthday party, we're like, oh my gosh, I don't have a gift. Oh, hold on a sec, I, I remember I had this, you know, I'll give them this, or I'll give them that. When they would pick the sheep, a lot of thought and care went into the sheep. Because they didn't want to just give God anything, they wanted to give God the best. So when they went to the priest and presented their sheep to the priest, they were presenting to the priest what they considered to be the best of their crops, not the worst of their crops. Now, why on earth do you think they would do that? Because they realized and they understood that everything came from God. And if they gave God a sheaf as an offering, then they believed that God would bless the rest of the sheaves that were still sitting in the ground. And that's why it says here in Romans 11, uh, 16, Paul wrote, For if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. So if that first sheep was blessed by God, then the rest of the crops would also be blessed by God as well. Now it talks about here about some different sacrifices that they would offer up to God in order uh, as part of this feast. Now number one it says a male of the first year without blemish. And that would be their burnt offering. And this was one of the most common offerings that they would do and offered on a great many a variety of occasions. There were daily burnt offerings that they would offer up lambs. There were Sabbath offerings that they would offer up lambs. And then there were the offerings they would do uh, during the feast as well. Now, they would do the daily offerings, they would do both at morning and at night. Can you imagine how many lambs you would do this? And this was like, un un unlike the other offerings, you're like, the priest would get a cut, right? Now, the burnt offerings, the whole thing was put in there and it was just completely burnt up. So they would do that offering first. And they did that offering to make atonement for their sins, kind of like the push-up. That would be our modern-day push-up right there, Josh. But it wasn't a specific sin that they were, were apologizing for, but they were just admitting to God, like, God, I know I'm a sinner, so take the lamb as, as atonement for all my sin nature. And how many of us know, like, you know, we, we, try to, you know, we try to play off that, you know, God doesn't really know our sins. Like, well, God, if I sinned in any way, let me just have shot, and I'm sorry. And God's sitting up there like, dude, <laughs> A beach ball wouldn't even cover what you got. <laughs> so they were just saying, you know, this is kind of what God, I sin. I, I sin, I'm sorry, except the lamb. But they would also have a grain offering, and it says two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil. So after the burnt offering, they would give up this grain offering, and it was given to God, either cooked or uncooked, in an oven or a pan. And it says the requirements for the grain offering were that it had to be finely ground and have oil and salt in it. So you couldn't just give the grain, you had to also give, mix in with it oil and salt. But they also said that you could not have any yeast or honey in it as well. In Leviticus 2, 11 through 13, it says, Burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord. In every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. Now, it didn't tell them specifically how much grain to give. They left it up to that person. Now, think about this. The, the Israelites got lost for many years. They were kind of wandering around the desert, right? To give up that grain to God meant the lot. Because they were giving up something that would no longer be food for them to eat. To give up the lamb meant something because you're wandering around in the desert... You don't know when you're going to come up on the next Costco. So when you make these offerings, you're giving up food. You're giving up substance. You're giving up things that could actually keep you alive. Now this one, the grain offering was given, is actually is a sense of uh, worship. Acknowledgement of God's divine provision of the needs of the Israelites for life itself. So by giving up this grain offering, they were acknowledging that God would continue to provide for them in the future. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. And then in this passage it says that between the burnt offering and the grain offering, it produced a sweet aroma. 
And then it finally talks about a drink offering, wine one fourth of a bin, which would be, a, or excuse me, hen, which would be about a quart. Just like the grain offering, the, the drink offering was symbolic of the works of the worshiper. It was never to be offered alone, but also, but had to be offered with other things, with other offerings. But there was one case in Genesis uh, 35, 14, where Jacob offered up a drink offering on his own. It was poured out on the altar of the fire for every lamb, for each lamb that was sacrificed. So if you're sacrificing three lambs, you've got to pour out three hens of wine. Now, it was always wine. It was always really good wine. So you couldn't go to, like, Trader Joe's and get, like, a bottle of two-buck chop and pour it on there. You had to go to, like, a really nice wine store and get, like, the, the nicest wine. But see, here's where it kind of starts to click for us as Christians. Because God wanted the best and finest wine to be poured out as a drink offering and as a sacrifice. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember Jesus saying something about that as well at the Last Supper. Luke 22, 20, Jesus said, This is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. The Jews considered their wine a drink offering to God. Jesus was our drink offering to God. We don't ever have to worry about having a drink offering because Jesus was our drink offering. We don't have to do a drink offering every month, or excuse me, every year, because Jesus did it once and for all. You see, what the Jewish people didn't understand and what they still don't understand is so many of these festivals and these feasts prophesied about Jesus Christ. Jesus was the Lamb, amen, Jesus' blood was poured out for us, but yet they still wait for these things to happen. And in verse 10 it said, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you. You see, when the farmer brought the sheaf of Greta barley, he did it in acknowledging for what God had done for him. He did it for acknowledging that this represented all the blessings that were still sitting in the ground of his crops. Now, how many times do we acknowledge God for all that he does in our lives? I can't remember, was it Frank Sinatra or one of those guys that sing that song, I Did It My Way? We, we live in that mindset, to be honest with you, a lot of us do, where we, we assume that we did it my way. I did it. I earned it. I deserve it. But see, the Jewish farmers had the right concept. Anything that came up from the ground was not by their own doing. Anything that came up from the ground was only by God. It was through His care and nurturing and watering of the seed that would allow the barley to grow up into something that they could use. And that's why they made these feasts such a big deal, because they acknowledged that everything they had was from God. And as we sit here today in our society where everything is at our fingertips, no matter what, I could be up here right now, and even without you guys knowing it, I could go online, order something, it would be delivered to my house in two days. We have to remember also that everything we have is from God. Everything. I hate to burst your bubble, but you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. And the same thing goes with me. And that's why I tell people, be careful what you pray for because you just might get it. Because it seems like when things are going really well in our lives, right? We just don't need God that much. Right? I'm, I'm doing it. I'm making it happen. Life is good. But yet God says... Everything you have, from the clothes you're wearing to the money you have in your, your pocket, well, apparently God didn't give me so much of that. Um, <laughs> everything you have, your health, your family, your jobs, everything you have has come from God. Now, do we really sit and we think about that? Do we every day thank God for everything we have in our lives? Or do we spend our time with Him complaining about the things we don't have? You see, the Jewish people realized that everything they had was from God. 
Deuteronomy 26, 10 and 11 says, And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you in your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. Regardless of what you have, regardless of whether or not you like it, regardless of whether or not you want something different, we must rejoice every day for what the Lord has given us. Because it is only by His doing that we have anything. And this first sheep that was picked out of the crops and brought to the priest, it wasn't eaten. It wasn't tasted. It was brought directly to the priest so that he could take it and he could wave it as an offering to God. The land produced nothing as a result of human power, but all of God. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Everything you see, everything you touch, everything you breathe was created by God. And He owns it. It's not ours. It never has been. It never will be. So whatever God chooses to give us that day, then we, like the Israelites, must be thankful and we must give thanks and we must honor and remember Him for what He has done. But too many times we, we get that mindset. You know, we may sit here and criticize Kanye West or whoever put that Bible together, but how many times have we wrote our own Bible where we kind of make us God? The Jewish people make us remember that everything we have is from God. I remember my grandpa was a farmer, and there were years when things were, because this was a long time ago, they didn't have the sprinkling systems yet. There were years when things were really bone dry because there was no rain, and the crops didn't show up. They recognized that everything they had or didn't have was from God. Just like we must recognize everything we have is from God and only God. Then they said, Then you shall bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, these first fruits, as I said, they were always, always the choicest, the finest, the nicest, the best. Because you wouldn't want to give God anything other than that, amen? We want to give God our first, we don't want to give God our leftovers. So there was great care taken by these Jewish people into selecting just the right sheep so that they could give it to God. And that it would be something that God would be pleased in. You see, in our lives, just like the Jewish people realize, in our lives, God doesn't just deserve the first of anything. But God also deserves the best of everything that we can offer. And when the Jewish people took the sheep of barley in, it symbolized their recognition and their identification that everything in that harvest belonged to God and not them. Everything in that harvest belonged to God and not them. We must understand that we must also offer God our very best in our lives as well. With money, with time, with resources. Everything we have has been given to us by God. And the God who claims to want to be first in our life also wants to have claim of everything in our life. We are called daily to offer everything in our lives to Him. Everything. How we spend our time. As Pastor Reuben said, evangelizing. Showing people, telling people about God's Word. How we handle our finances. I was listening, it's funny. I was listening to this sermon this morning, and the pastor was talking about tithes. I'm like, oh, this is hilarious. Because 
You know, I'm, I'm not a person that talks about tithes. If you've ever noticed that, I've never really had a sermon about tithing. Now, there are some pastors that every message has something to do with tithes. Or a Gulfstream jet that they need. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have a Gulfstream jet, okay? I promise you that. I like helicopters. No. <laughs> but, but then there are other pastors who, like me, who really don't feel called to talk about tithing a lot. And I have to tell you that that's probably not the right thing either. Because I think as a pastor, we have a duty, as Pastor Ruben said, we have a duty and obligation to talk to you about all things in the Bible. And as this pastor was saying this morning, you know, when you say, well, I'm going to start talking about tithes, people get a little uncomfortable, like, oh my gosh, oh, you know, squirming and stuff. But they don't understand, Jesus talked far, far more about tithing in the Bible than he talked about loving your neighbor. But yet, if I were to say, this message is going to be about loving your neighbor, you'd be like, that's so nice, right? <laughs> But when the, the, the T word shows up, it's like, oh my dear, no, 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 no. This, this guy's crazy, right? But we have an obligation to talk about tithing. And that's exactly what the Jewish people did here. They tithed, they gave the first and the best of what they had to God in recognition, knowing that God was going to provide for them. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you have to start tithing. That's, that's between you and God. That's why I don't get involved in the tithes here. I don't know who gives or who doesn't give. Because I don't think that's my responsibility. I believe that that's between you and God. But I do want you to know that when we tithe, when we give our monies to God, we are recognizing, we are acknowledging to Him that we have faith and we trust that He is going to provide for every one of our needs. See, God already owns the money, right? That's why the, the dollar bill says, in God we trust. He already owns the money. He, borrow, he lets us borrow it. So when we give money back to God, it's an act of obedience and it's an act of faith. He wants to know whether or not you're going to trust Him with all aspects of your life. That's why when the, the, the basket goes around, it's really... A test of faith for you. God's church doesn't need the money. He already owns it. But he wants us to have faith. And see, it doesn't just stop at people. We as a church must tithe as well. And as I told you before, late in 2014, we had to write a really big check to Foursquare. Because we, had, we forgot to write the checks, right? And, and, and I wanted to do what was right. And we were going to get caught up with Foursquare. And, and I'll tell you, that was a really interesting place to be in because after we wrote that check, we literally had like nothing in the bank. Literally nothing in the bank. Mm -hmm. But see, we offered up our first sheet because we believed that God would provide the rest. <clears throat> I can tell you today, probably less than six months, it's been about six months, six months after we wrote that check, this church has never been in better financial situation condition right now. And I can tell you right now that God is going to bless it even more than that. Amen. And I'm not saying I know He's going to bless because I know it's coming in. We took an act and leap of faith, trusting that God was going to provide. And He has provided abundantly. Now, here's another funny thing. You know, God, God is so good. So... We end up, we write this huge check to Foursquare, and people are like, dude, what were you doing? I would have spent like the next year giving it to them, little by little. I'm like, no, we wanted to get right with them. Foursquare came out earlier this year, and they said, you know, we want to start blessing the churches, so we're going to give checks to churches in April, and we're going to do it based upon a percentage of the ties they gave in the last six months of 2014. Thank you, Jesus, because my big check's coming back, amen? But see, God... When we act in faith, God provides the rest. Now, I'm not one of those guys that, am I just getting taller up here? I feel like I'm getting taller. God's not one of those guys who's going to sit there. You know, I, I'm not saying that, you know, get the money you have in the bank and give it all to God and God's going to bless you. I'm not one of those people. What I am saying, though, is if you begin to take leaps and steps of faith, God will honor that. God will provide that. God will protect that. But it isn't just about money. It's about our bodies. Our bodies are a temple. The
The Bible says that we are His workmanship and God created us in His own image. What are we doing with our bodies to honor God? What are we doing with our bodies to give back to God? Are we giving Him our first or are we giving Him our last? Do we get up in the morning and read the Bible and pray to God or do we wait till the end of the day and just fall asleep back Are our schedules so busy that we don't have any time for God? Now I can tell you this. That I've noticed on my days, when I get up and spend time with God and actually read my Bible and do the devotionals, I somehow have a way of getting everything in that I need to get done. The days when I don't do that, I run out of time. You see, when we give God our best of our body and our time, He will provide for all the rest. And there are days when I have to make a decision, when I know that there are many things that I have to get done, but I know that the prayer and devotional time is important. I do the prayer and devotional time, and I say in prayer to God, God, you know what I've got to get done today. God, help me. And He always does. The sheep was the leap of faith for the Jewish people. Because they were acknowledging that it was from God. They were acknowledging that everything else in their crops was from God. They were acknowledging that God would continue to bless them as long as he, they continued to honor and give thanks to Him. So as Pastor Lubin said today, we must be the first fruits of God. James 1.18 says that, that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Our time our finances, our, act, our actions are all first fruit offerings to the Lord. So when we give Him our first fruit offerings, we are acknowledging His position in our lives. We are acknowledging that He is first and foremost above all other things. We are acknowledging that we recognize that He has given everything to us and when He gives it to us and we give back, we are acknowledging that we also have faith that He will continue to provide for us. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. As Christians, as pastors, as churches, I believe we get ourselves into trouble when we take our eyes off of God. When we start to make it about ourselves, we stop making it about God. When we start to put our own names into the Bible, well, that's not a good slide at all, huh? I'm sorry about that. It's too bad because it was a green offering. It was a great picture. Sorry about that. I noticed, I noticed Dave Squint back there. I'm like, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I just kept me back. I'll, I'll give you the word for that. Sorry. Um, but when we start putting our own names in the Bible, then we're no longer allowing God to be our God. And what the Jewish people through this feast were acknowledging is that God was their God at all times and in all situations. You get a raise at work, praise God. You get a great check by the doctor, praise God. You enter into a new relationship where your relationship is healed, then praise God. Everything you have is from God. So everything we are must be given to God. See, we must offer our God our very best, but, but before the farmers would even eat. Now, the picture is probably kind of hungry. You walk around the desert all day, it's kind of hot, you're going to get hungry. But before they would eat, they would offer up this sacrifice to God. Before and above all else, they made God their priority in their life. When women came to the tomb on Easter morning, as the priests were doing the sheaf, the wave offering to God, they realized that Jesus had become the first fruit. They realized that God had given Jesus the first fruit, his first 
his best of everything. 1 Corinthians 15.20 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. asleep. Just as the priest would wave the sheep, saying, acknowledging there is more to come, God used Jesus as His first fruit to acknowledge that there would be more to come. Because of His death and His resurrection, there would be more lives in heaven because of that. We wouldn't have to worry about push-ups. We wouldn't have to worry about $10. We wouldn't have to worry about any of that. Jesus had become our sacrifice. Jesus had become our first fruit. And because of that, we also must give thanks and celebrate that. But the question becomes, are you willing to offer your first to God? Are you willing to offer your first to God? God had given us His best. He gave us Jesus. And as Jesus hung on the cross and as He sat in the tomb and as He resurrected three days later, he did something that nobody else could or would ever do. So if God was willing to give us His best, then the question is, are you willing to give God your best? Are you ready and willing to acknowledge that everything you have is from God? Are you ready and willing to acknowledge that anything you receive in the future will be from God? Are you ready to acknowledge that we are nothing without God? You see, we try to project ourselves as being so strong and self-sufficient. That isn't where God wants us. God wants us as humble and meek and weak people that He and only He can make strong. Now, if you look at some of these things, you would ask, why on earth would they have to do grain and wine and lambs and cattle? To me, I honestly, living in today's world, that just kind of seems silly. Like, you know, really throwing a, you know, a, a lamb onto fire? You know, sprinkling grain on fire, pouring wine on fire, getting a bull and, and sacrificing the bull and putting the bull on fire? Just, it kind of is silly, right? Why would God make them do that? Because in their day and age, that was very precious to them. You know, God didn't need the lamb. God didn't need the grain. God didn't need the wine. But what he needed to see was whether or not they would be obedient and faithful to him. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your time. God doesn't need your resources. But what he's waiting to see is will you be obedient and faithful with what he is giving you? In so many areas of our lives, we have absolutely no problem with that. If somebody helps us, we feel obligated to go help them one day. If somebody makes us dinner or buys us dinner, we feel obligated to give back to them because it's the right thing to do. But why, when it comes to God, do we have such a problem with Why, when God asks you for your time, are we so eager to make up excuses as to why we can't? Why, when God asks you for your money, do we come up with so many excuses and reasons why we can't give it to Him? Why, when God asks you to be faithful and obedient and talk to someone, and we come up with so many reasons as to why we shouldn't. Yes, God did provide everything for us. He gave it to us free to charge. No contract to sign, no questions asked. But He wants to see what you're going to do with it. Too many times, and Jared and Rick, if you want to come on up, too many times we get caught up in the fact that, that we work so hard to gain things here in this life, but it means nothing to us. The Bible says we should store up our treasures here on earth, right? No. Where does it say we should store up our treasures? In heaven. In heaven. 
But so many times in this world, in this society, we get caught up on the temporary things, the things that are going to rust, the things that are going to break, the darn iPhones that you're going to upgrade and then they don't work anymore. But we fail to focus on eternity. This pastor this morning was saying, you know, what's the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven? Is it going to be, hey, where's my mansion? You know, I got to check out the thing. You know, how big is this thing, right? Or are we going to be more focused on where are all the people I miss? You see, we should live our lives. We should give our resources with that in mind. With the goal being that when we get to heaven, we will see all the people we miss. We will see all the people we told Jesus about. Don't get caught up in the mansion. I, I gotta be honest, it's heaven, okay? I'll take a cardboard box in heaven. It's still heaven. I still get the in and out milkshake stream rolling through heaven, right? <laughs> but what I'm excited about is who's gonna be up there? Church, that's the part we play. That's why God wants our resources, our time, our money. Because we can have other people up there with us. He doesn't need our money to build the mansions. He's already built them. But he wants to see whether or not you're going to be faithful with what he's giving you. You know, when you begin to think about it, when you begin to realize that everything we have, God gave us on loan, it's kind of easier to think about maybe giving back to him. You know, everybody hates the dreaded taxes, right? Oh, taxes. When I used to run all my consulting business, you know, people swear and curse, you know, the government, all oh, taxes and that, right? You know what I thought? Every time I, hear me out, church, every time I got to write a check to the government, I celebrated. You know why? Because that meant I actually made money. Because when I had my consulting business, I'll be honest with you, there were many quarters that I would just write a little note to the IRS saying, I wish you were here. Because I didn't make money. So every time I get to write a check to the government, I say, thank you, Jesus. Every time we get to write a check to God, we should say, thank you, Jesus. Because God, if it wasn't for your provision and your blessing, I wouldn't have a check to write. Every time we get to talk to someone about Jesus Christ, we should say, thank you, Jesus. Because God, if it wasn't for the gifts and the talents you've given me, I wouldn't know what to say. Every time we get to give food to the homeless or a blanket or something, we should thank God because if it wasn't for His provision, we wouldn't have anything to provide. God may ask you to do some pretty silly stuff. Maybe not burn brain, but maybe go talk to someone. not because of what you will do. He just wants to know that you do. So if you take anything from this feast today, just as the Jewish people did, we should live our lives in obedience and acknowledgement that everything we have belongs to God. And everything we give to Him should be our first and our best. If you need prayer, there will be a few people in the back. And uh, you can go down for prayer or you can ask someone around you. My Lord, my God,
Yes, Lord, we look to you. We trust you. That's why we can give you our best, Lord. It's because you deserve it. And we can, because we can trust that when you, we give you our best, that you will use it the best way possible. So, Lord, we declare that we will serve you with the best of our resources, with the best of our time, Lord, with the best of everything we can, that we give you the best of us because of what you've done for us. Look what you've done for me. Your blood has set me free. Jesus, my Lord, look what you've done for me. other and we have you to help us figure this thing out. So Lord, please guide us this week in knowing what we can do for you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, if you didn't get prayer and you need prayer, go ahead and find someone. And if you need some chips and salsa, uh, those that will be in the back. And have a, have a blessed week. you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a four-square Christian church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, 
visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626 914 3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.